So I took a break from flat earth videos because I didn't want to lose too many brain cells at once. But now it's back, so let's do this I guess. <sighs> Why do I do this to myself? The solar eclipse is coming up here in what, two days? You want to go ahead and share this because this is irrefutable evidence what I'm about to show you. So this guy here on YouTube, Professor Stick. Oh hey, who's that handsome stick figure there? He comes out with a video and it's gaining quite a lot of momentum. And it's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> alright, alright. So this guy, Bro Sanchez, did a live stream responding to my Flat Earth video about the solar eclipse. The stream itself is quite long, and he keeps repeating the same thing over and over again, so I will just respond to the relevant parts. Jesus, can you at least make it succinct a bit? Say what you need to say once, people will hear it. No need to repeat it like 50 times. He's supposedly be debunking D-Marble, so you know I gotta come put in at work. Now, if you check the description area, you can see D Marble's channel, and you can also see this nutcase channel who think he debunking something. <laughs> now, this is a 12 minute long video, but I don't want to watch this whole video. I just put the link in the description for you guys to do that. How absolutely fucking convenient for you. Now usually I get why people don't want to respond to entire 12 minute long videos. I do it myself all the time. However, and here's the good part, the main arguments you bring up in your video were easily answered if you just kept watching. Which makes me reach one of two conclusions. Either you were too dishonest to even watch the entire video, which even if I don't respond to the whole thing I would at least watch it. Or you did watch it but realized that it already pre-debunked your argument so you purposely left it out. Either way you're going to be exposed to here. I'm just gonna play about three minutes of this video because that's all I need to play to make my point and debunk his whole 12 minute video. Which makes me suspect a third possibility, that you did watch my entire video but simply just didn't understand it. The way a lot of globalists are trying to debunk Flat Earth with this solar eclipse, either they're ignorant or disingenuine and I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about here so let's go ahead and play this so we can begin. Alright so he's going to start playing my video now. Normally I would consider cutting this part out or shortening it since you guys probably have seen my video already but I'll leave it in for context purposes. Maybe I'll put a timer here or something if you guys want to skip him replaying my video. So as you guys have probably heard, there's a solar eclipse that will be happening on August 21st and boy oh boy do we have the flat earthers jumping straight into this topic. I looked around for a few videos and I found one that has quite a decent amount of views. So I said to myself, well since a lot of people have seen this video, this is probably the best one to debunk. So here it is. So there's a lot of talk about eclipses lately due to the upcoming event of the August 21st solar eclipse. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon's shadow falls somewhere on the Earth's surface. A lunar eclipse is the opposite. This happens when the Earth's shadow falls on the moon. So he goes on to explain how eclipses work before he tries to debunk it. I'm sure you guys are well versed in your astronomy, so I'm going to skip this part. Feel free to head to the original video to watch the whole thing if you like. During the total solar eclipse taking place on August 21st, a strange occurrence is going to take place. During this particular eclipse, the shadow of the moon will be traveling from the west coast to the east coast. I don't know why you said in this particular eclipse, since for all solar eclipses, the shadow will travel from west to east. But whatever, let's keep going. In a short video, and I'll post this link below in the description, the question was posed to the Washington Post as to why. Many people are asking the question, why the shadow is going to be moving from the west to the east coast. Well, you see, there's a pretty simple explanation, really. The Earth is rotating counterclockwise as seen looking down at the North Pole. Normally, if we place the moon as being stationary, then it wouldn't make any sense for the shadow to be traveling from west to east. However, that is not the case. The moon itself is traveling in a counterclockwise direction around the Earth as well, as seen from above the North Pole. Well, actually, from the Earth's perspective, since we have a greater angular speed than that of the moon's orbit, it looks as if the moon is traveling from east to west, or clockwise as seen from above the North Pole. But for the purposes of this model, we will look at it from an absolute perspective instead of a relative one. So the moon is traveling counterclock. Okay, two minutes into the video and I can tell you right now the globe is already debunked 
And what Professor Stick is doing right now is disingenuine. And that's all he plays of my video. Notice how I haven't even gotten into the meat of my argument yet. I've hardly said a thing. His video didn't debunk any of my video's content. The main points I make? The arguments I presented to counter D. Marble's claims on the solar eclipse? Sanchez ignores all of it and brings up this one thing about the visual model that the Washington Post used. Think about it. 26 fucking minutes and he says one thing. What you mean, Brother Sanchez? Well, look at the model. D. Marble is actually debunking this model. Professor Stick is using this model to make his argument. Actually, you're not exactly correct here. I was simply outlining how an eclipse works. It wasn't an argument against D. Marble. This was already explained in the Washington Post's video that D. Marble responded to. The reason I explained it myself was so I didn't have to play too much of the original video. So we're gonna use this model to debunk his argument. How am I gonna do that? Well, simple. The model he's using is inaccurate. Therefore, it debunks his whole experiment. Well, no f***ing shit. Thanks for telling us the obvious. Except that we don't claim that this model is to scale. Look at it. It's a fucking cartoon, goddammit. In other words, look at the moon in this model. Check this out, right? Look at the moon in the model. Now, I want y'all to pay attention to that because we are taught that the moon is 238,000 miles away from Earth. And if this was a miniature scale of our moon and Earth, this would really be disingenuous. Okay, I'm going to explain this in easy terms so you understand. This model isn't to scale, correct, but we don't claim it is. If you kept watching my video instead of stopping two minutes in, you would have saw that I literally said that I don't like this model due to it not being to scale. This animation was pulled from the Washington Post and is a pretty good illustration, but I personally don't like it that much since they made the moon's angular speed much greater than the Earth's. I understand why they did this though as to not make it more complicated than needed to understand this concept. And then immediately afterwards, I put in a simulation made by someone in D. Marble's comment section in order to show what it would actually look like to scale. This actual model demonstrates how the moon can have a faster tangent velocity than the Earth, but yet has a lower angular velocity. Which, by the way, if you kept watching my video, I explained the difference between the two, and even gave mathematical proof. I bet you didn't even see that. Look, you can give my video another shot if you like, but it'd be much more honest if you 1. actually watched my entire video, and 2. addressed the actual argument I was making instead of stopping my video before I even did any debunking. If you want to make this moon 238,000 miles away and use a miniature scale like this one, it would look something like this. Here we go right here. This is a good one. Oh yeah, that's definitely what it looks like. Seems we can agree on one point. The thing is, we're not purposely using a smaller model in order to trick people. You know that your argument actually helps us, right? Because if the not-to-scale model were used, we wouldn't be able to show how the moon has a greater tangent velocity but a lower angular velocity. Only the actual model to scale can show that, because this faulty model makes it appear that the moon's revolution is much, much faster than it actually is. So thank you for strengthening our model. But you probably didn't understand a thing I said here, so moving on. The model that these globalists are using is gonna work with the globe because it's disingenuous. Actually, nope. It doesn't work with the globe. The one to scale does. So in that case, why do we use the wrong one? I'll explain that next. Look at how close this moon is to Earth. Now, I want to point out some more stuff to you. So, one thing I want to point out is the path of the solar eclipse as you can see here. Usually when you see wacky space pictures, the moon is unrealistically close to the earth. What's up with that? That's what's going on here in his model. Okay, this is why we use the not to scale model. Because it's easier to see. It's easier to look at. The audience on the internet or on the Washington Post are people who generally aren't experts in astronomy. If we showed them the actual model, it can be difficult to visualize due to how fucking small the Earth and the Moon would have to be. However, if we use this wrong model, it's much, much easier to see. And we use that everywhere on the internet due to how much better it looks. It has nothing to do with what you think. The globalists are using the wrong scale to try to debunk flat earth, but they're being disingenuous. Actually, no, I wasn't using this model to debunk the flat earth. I use this model to better help my audience visualize why the eclipse shadow moves from west to east, and I'm sure that's why the Washington Post used it too. For my actual debunking of the flat earth, I used math in another simulated model, which I put in parts of the video after the point in which you stop watching. You see, let me show y'all something. 
This is how flat earth look. I'm going to say a solar eclipse look over flat earth. What I want you to pay attention to is the size of the sun and moon being uh, the same. Yeah, yeah, I raised a number of arguments against this model in my previous video, so you can actually go and watch my video this time. How about that? Moving on. Look at this picture right here. You got the earth to the left, the moon way over here to the right. This how the model would actually look if the moon was 250,000 miles away. It would actually, this would be the correct scale. So I got a question for you. Here's the path of the solar eclipse. Why the hell is it only visible in America? Well, it's not usually like this. Every solar eclipse is different. This one just so happened to be passing through America. And it is local because the moon falls under a certain large size range. It makes complete sense. But you have another concern about this, don't you? If we were on a globe with the moon 238,000 miles away, why do we see a circular pattern? Look at the moon in this diagram they're using. The shadow has a slight curve in its path because the moon doesn't just travel in a fucking straight line in its orbit. It has a slight tilt, and along with the tilt of the Earth's axis, it can curve the path of the shadow. But of course, it's different each time. The thing is, scientists are able to calculate exactly where the shadow will be. They are able to determine with perfect precision on the path. But what has flat Earth scientists given us? Nothing. Again, with the moon 250,000 miles away, Everybody on that side of the globe would see this eclipse. It wouldn't just be limited to North America. Wrong. The only way the shadow would encompass the entire Earth is if the moon were much, much larger than what it is now. Too small and we wouldn't get a total eclipse. And this range of size is extremely large. The moon could have landed anywhere in that range really and it would be a local eclipse. In fact, the moon would have to be larger than the Earth itself in order to cast a total eclipse on the entire planet due to the presence of the penumbra. The sun's massive size would cause partial eclipses in certain areas. Since the total eclipse area, the umbra, will always be smaller than the moon's size, the moon would have to physically be larger than the Earth in order to cover up the entire planet with a total eclipse. And when it's that size, it's not really a moon by strict definition anymore. You can't have a globe model with a moon that far away. We're talking, you know, a quarter million miles, and you telling me we're only gonna see this eclipse, you know, we're only gonna see it from the Americas? You know, Earth isn't the only planet that has solar eclipses. Just look at other planets like Jupiter or Saturn. They have plenty of eclipses that you can clearly see the shadow and how it's only a local one. Explain that on a flat Earth model. NASA teaches us that the moon is 238,000 miles away, yet when they're trying to explain this eclipse, they're using a bogus model, just like their minions like Professor Stick. Alright, so Sanchez pretty much says nothing else in this video. No new arguments. So I'm going to leave it at that. Sanchez, if you're watching this, I applaud you for getting this far. Hopefully you'll rewatch my previous video so you don't embarrass yourself again. For my regular viewers, I'm having a Halloween video next week. Hopefully. So stay tuned for that.